be seated. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be at today. So grab your Bible, turn open your Bible app. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5 today as we are uh, continuing in our series. Our series called As I Grow Up, I Want to Be. And today we're tackling the idea of holiness. Uh, One of the most uh, profound uh, yet Um, challenging aspects of Christianity is how the gospel is meant to foundationally change uh, who we are. So when we talk about the gospel, often the message is often presented uh, the idea that that Jesus came to rescue us from our sin. And if we we place our our faith in him, then we'll have eternal life, we'll be saved. And and, and all of that is true. And in many ways, that's that's a very foundational uh, understanding of of what the gospel is. But but it's also true uh, that the, the grace that Jesus pours out on us is meant to change who we are right now. Uh, His grace isn't just uh, for the future. It isn't just uh, your get-out-of-jail-free card. You get to spend eternity in in heaven. Uh, But it's meant to impact our our daily lives. And so the gospel changes both our our actions and our our attitudes and and our worldview. Now, I think that this is so important for us to to understand. In in many ways, you can see that that this sounds good and it sounds beautiful, that, that, you know, that that Jesus changes us until we realize that change isn't always easy. You know, if if you think about yourself or even uh, you look at like a, uh, research on different people's attitudes towards change, you can see that it creates a, I think what we call it a, a bell curve. Uh, so uh, the response to change, there, there are very, very few people who, who love change. Uh, you know, very, very few people who are just are all on board of it. They, they don't care about technology changing, their job changing, uh, where they're living, all, like doesn't matter. They're all for it. Change is good. And then on the other end, there are those who just will, will never, ever change. This will not do it. And there are very few people on, on either extremes of this. But what we see is that most people fall directly in the middle of this. I don't like change. I'll do it if you, if you make me. But I'm going to kick and scream my whole way there. You've got to convince me that this change is, is actually good. Why should I adopt this new perspective? Why should I go out and get that new iPhone or, or whatever it is? And, and so the... the all of that is, is how we typically view change, but the, the hardest change is when it involves our deepest held beliefs and values. These are the things that we find incredibly hard to, to change about ourselves. And, and every person who is, who is married uh, knows this about them when you, when you first got married. Because you, you married someone who is, who is different than you and has a different family background, And then all of a sudden, life is good, everything is great, until you get to like your first Christmas, and then she says, this is how my family does Christmas, and you're like, well, that's weird. That's not how you do Christmas. No, no, we open gifts at like the crack of dawn. Like that's that's how you do Christmas. If you're waiting until, you know, everyone's awake and had coffee and breakfast, like you're doing it wrong. Like, like you, you don't understand Christmas. You don't even love Jesus. So, like, <laughs> so like you, all of a sudden you realize, wait, wait, wait. Is this, this like a deeply held belief I've had? Like, why? Why is this? And it's just the way that we are, and suddenly you're getting challenged on it. You have to see, okay, well, maybe, maybe that change is good. Maybe starting the day with cinnamon buns is not too bad at Christmas. Anyways, that's my tradition. Okay, so, so as we look into Ephesians 5, like this is, this is where we need to understand where the apostle Paul is going. He, he's addressing change that is, that is meant to really happen in our lives when we encounter Jesus. This is what is supposed to happen to us. And he gets really direct as he writes this, to the Ephesian church, and as we receive it today, he gives a direct 
confrontation to them. So I want to start off Ephesians 5. Uh, we're going to look at starting off in verse 3, and we're going to go down to uh, verse 8 right now. So verse 3 says this, that sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you, as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks for know and recognize this. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord." Walk as children of light. All right, so the Apostle Paul, he just jumps right into it today. And this is so important for us to get as we read a passage like this. Most of us can't help but read a passage like this as as a list of of do's and don'ts. Uh, Especially if you're new to Christianity, if church and Christianity, if if all of this is kind of new to you, uh, you know, you, you might be coming into this a little bit suspicious that, you know, this whole thing really just kind of boils down to morality. And you might be on board with that morality or you might be suspicious of it, of like, is this actually the best morality in which we can live by? And so you might say, when you read a passage like this, like, aha, I knew, I knew that being a Christian was really just all about, you know, saying and doing the right things. You know, it's just, it's just about following the rules. And depending on your personality, there is a temptation. There's a temptation If we see this as a list of rules, it's a temptation either to run toward or away from those rules. In many ways, this comes down to our personality type, and it comes down to the the culture in which we, that we grew up in, and all of us grew up in slightly different cultures from each other. And and so for for some, a passage like this, you know, it's maybe for you, it's, it's exactly what you've been looking for. Maybe for you, you know, you've been... You're not really not all that, all that. <laughs> you might say that you, you wish the Bible was mostly consisted of, of bullet points. You know, it's kind of long. There's a lot of stories. You just kind of want the, the gist of it. Like, what, what is it really getting at? And so for the type A's out there, you know, you, you might be thinking, okay, great. Just, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Tell me what to avoid, and I'll avoid it, and I'll get this thing done. Maybe that's some of you. And for others of you, when it comes to a list, if you feel like you're seeing a list of rules, you feel the opposite. You kind of feel like you want to run away from it. You're not really all that interested in a list like this. Your inner lawyer comes out and just, you know, just begins to come out and you say, well, you know, I I want to argue with everything in this passage. I want to find the loopholes. I want to justify myself and say, hey, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't even see myself in a passage like this. You read something about sexual immorality. You're like, okay, okay, that's, that's, okay, that's a clear rule. No, that's, that's bad. Don't do that. And then it mentions crude joking. And now all of a sudden, okay, the passage has gone too far. You know, isn't that kind of prudish? Like, can't we just, you know, a joke's just a joke. Like, who cares? You know, why, why is it getting after these things? Why does the Bible care about this? And regardless of where our natural tendency is, it's important to understand that this is more than a list of rules. It, it's more than that then I think that that is, that is so incredibly helpful for us to understand as we dig into this passage. That this is more than just a, a, a list because it begins to help us to understand, especially as our world around us begins to have a different understanding of this idea of, of sin and of guilt. Now, there was a long time where in the West, that was the main focus in our culture, but, but things have been changing over the past uh, 30 or 50 years, uh, especially as our world becomes more multicultural 
and as we begin to adopt more of a postmodern mindset, which all of which means that there are far more options out there. It means that with postmodernism, that there, the truth is no longer held as, as, as high of a standard. And so now our culture has slowly shifted away from a, a guilt-based culture and more into a, a shame-based culture, more into shame. So it's not about that there's, that there's objective truth and I'm guilty if I go against this objective morality, but now it becomes an issue of as long as no one sees me as a bad person, as long as no one perceives me as this, and, and I won't feel shame, and then, then life is okay. In so many ways, we just become the judges and juries of one another around us. And the helpful thing in this passage that it addresses both of those mindsets of guilt and addresses the issue of shame. Because both of those lead to the same issue. Both, if you feel guilt or if you feel shame, either way you feel condemned and you feel as though, what is the point in this life? Will I ever be free from this feeling? And this is what the gospel is meant to actually address for us. As we understand what what Jesus is getting at in this passage. And I think a key here is found in verse 5. In verse 5, I'll read it again. It says, for you know and recognize this, that every sexual, sexually immoral or impure or greedy person... And you can underline this, so he says, who is an idolater. This becomes the the key for this entire passage is understanding why all of a sudden is he talking about all these things and all of a sudden he boils it down to, okay, and, and if you're in any of these categories, which all of us will be at some level, then he says that then you're you're an idolater. I mean here we we see the root of the problem. It's not it's not the actions of what is happening but it's what the actions mean about the person. And so understand this, the key to understand this passage, that God cares more about our hearts than he cares about what we do. God cares more about your heart. The primary issue here isn't that we sin, the primary issue is, is why do we do this? Why do we fall short of God's standards? And, and in verse 5, it reveals it's an issue of idolatry. Every sin issue ultimately boils down to the fact that we have placed our trust and our hope in something other than God. And this is so easy for it to creep into our lives. We place our hope, our trust in something other than him. And so when we give in to sexual immorality, it's because we have placed our trust and our hope in, in pleasure. And as long as I have that, then life is okay. We, we give in to greed, not because we're just a greedy person, but because we have placed our hope in the accumulation of stuff. We place that as the ultimate thing in our lives. It's where we place our hope and our trust. And we give into crude language because we believe that, that nothing truly matters other than ourselves. So a joke is just a joke. It doesn't really matter. What, why get offended? It's just words. But again, we see that all this boils down to this idea of placing something else above God in our lives. And the Bible is clear in the issue of why idolatry, of why this is something we actually need to deal with. And it boils down to this, is that idols, whatever they are in our lives, they end up taking what is often the, the best part of us and it twists it into something ugly. It takes something, the the best part, it takes something good, it takes something such as as pleasure, it takes something as good as sex, and it it twists it around to the point where it actually ends up 
hurting the people around us and abusing others. It takes something such as the, uh, the stuff that we have, the finances that we have available to us, which is, is meant to be a good gift from God, and, and it twists it around into something ugly. But here's the difference of what, I, what God does. Rather than an idol that only takes the best of us and ultimately leaves us empty, what God does is that he wants all of us. He wants both the good and the bad. You can bring all of yourself to him today. This is what he's calling us to. And I think that this is so good for us to be reminded of as we talk about this idea of holiness this morning. Because often when it comes to holiness, we, we tend to think of ourselves, you know, like God's calling us to be holy, to be pure before him. And, and we know deep in our hearts, say, hey, there, there's, there's stuff in my life. I've, I've let him down in these different ways. And so I mean, you might be feeling today like this is just a, a too lofty of a goal and you just give up on it to say, okay, it's too much. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to go and just live my life now. Or for those type A's, you might just keep on seeing this. This is the thing I'm going to fix. I'm going to solve it for myself. And what we need to see is God calls us to his standard of holiness. is that he calls all of us and every part of us. You need to understand that, that it, God wants every aspect of this. And we see this really clearly in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, starting off in verse 15, uh, the Apostle Peter begins to uh, explain that we are called to be holy. Verse 16 says, be, for it's written, be holy because I am holy. He's rooting it in God's holiness, this call to be holy, to be more like him. And then from there, he goes on to explain in verse 19 that we can only receive this, holy, this holiness because of the sacrifice of what Christ did for us on the cross. That he's the one who, who draws us in. He's the one who forms and, and changes us. And he, he changes us out of our very core so at its core, every sin issue is an issue of idolatry. And so we, easily, uh, so we so easily turn our hearts away from God. But if we want to live a holy life, our hearts need to then there be reoriented towards him. Now, this is uh, the issue of the heart. We see it time and time again throughout Scripture. One of the clear examples is in Psalm chapter 51. Uh, King David writes this psalm in response to being confronted by the prophet Nathan about his sin towards Bathsheba and her, and her family. And so David sits down and he writes this psalm. And in so many ways, you might expect him knowing that that's the heading of the psalm as, as, he, uh, as he deeply sinned against Bathsheba and, and her family and use his position of power against her, you, you would expect as he writes this psalm that he would be pleading with God, that he would, he would learn the right ways to live. He's going to change his actions. But in many ways, the psalm boils down to this, verse 10. He says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David begins to understand the reason why he fell into sin. Why he gave in to those desires was not because he didn't understand the rules set in front of him. It's because he had allowed his heart to turn away from God. And he understood that now what he needed was God to radically transform him at his core. It's only when our hearts are changed will our actions begin to follow. 
And often we, we think of it the other way. We think that we need to change the way in which we live, and, and then our, our heart will, will change. But this is what we see in Scripture. Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything flows from that. And then the rest of the proverb begins to talk about uh, what, we, what we say and what we do and our attitudes by saying, hey, the first thing that we need God to change is not our language, but the first thing he needs to change is who we are. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew 23, as he's addressing the Pharisees and he's addressing the hypocrisy of this very, very religious group, he explains to them this, Matthew 23, starting off in verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so the outside of it may also become clean. He sees there, this, this is the first thing that we need God to do in our lives is to change us from the inside out. And this is why rules of morality in the society around us will, will never, ever fully accomplish what they are trying to do. It, it's not an issue of we need further moral education in the world around us. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, they, uh, I think it was 2018 is when it really began to take off. You, uh, in, in Hollywood, in entertainment, they, they had the, the Me Too movement. Talking about sexual abuse within entertainment and, and in other broader areas of society. And in so many ways, this was a profoundly important movement of, of addressing hidden sin and hidden guilt and shame. And the problem is you see a, a movement like that, though. As I saw it all unfold, I'm like, we're going to be right back here, right back at it again in a few years, because it's not, it's not as though we needed to educate a few men on, hey, like, this is how you treat women. It wasn't an education. It wasn't as though any of them like, oh, I just never knew. No one ever told me this. It's because foundationally at our core, all of us struggle with sin, of giving in to desires that should not be fulfilled. And so this is what Jesus says, is that he cares more, not about what we're doing necessarily, but more about our heart, because that's the issue that needs to change first. And so when we think about becoming more holy, we often start with, with changing our actions, but the appeal of this passage is to change our hearts, because God cares about our heart. But this doesn't mean that he doesn't care about our actions as well. You need to understand this in the passage, that what we do is an indicator then of what is going on inside of our hearts. What we do is an indicator. If we want to know what's going inside of our hearts, we just have to see, okay, what, what do our actions actually tell us? You know, it, it, it's often the symptom is, is a revealing a bigger issue. And so if you go to a doctor, and if the doctor gives you two options of, hey, I can, I can deal with your, uh, with your symptoms that you've been, that you've been uh, chronically dealing with, or, or uh, I, can, uh, I can actually address the real issue. And all of us would say, okay, like, uh, address the real issue. I, I, I actually want to be cured. I actually want to have a, a solution. Don't just mask this. Uh, don't just deal with the symptoms. I, I need something that actually helps me and gives me greater health. And what Jesus wants is to not just mask symptoms, but actually give us greater spiritual and emotional health. Often when it comes to sin, we, we want to hide it. We want to mask it. We don't want anyone to know about it. Especially as our world moves more and more into a shame-based culture, we, now even more, we, just, we don't want anyone to know of what is actually happening in our lives. We don't want anyone to know about it, and we, we even want to avoid it ourselves, that we don't even recognize it anymore. But all that doesn't help. We see this in, in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 11. This is how the Apostle Paul addresses it. Verse 11, he says, Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. Instead, he says, expose them, bring them 
into the light. This is the only way in which we will actually begin to experience the heart change that Christ wants to give to us. In some ways, that might sound easy, but in reality, the exposing part is incredibly hard. And and this is why I'll point to this, why, why we are in so desperate need of community and having good friends, having those around us who are willing to actually point out the things in our lives that do need to change. When it comes to the way in which we go about our our work or how we relate to our family or talk to our kids or even just our disposition, we we need good friends in our lives that are willing to actually point this out to us and walk with us as we need to deal with sin in our lives. And and I truly believe that this is so incredibly important, that we don't just do this on our own, that we need good friends in our lives. And so this is why uh, this fall, as we're thinking about different equip classes and things to be studying, this is why, uh, as a church, we we have two studies that are going to be happening this fall, a women's study and a men's study, both of which are focused on true friendship and true community. Because we actually need people surrounded us, surrounding us in our lives to actually be able to point out to us what does it mean to follow Jesus. And so you need these people in your life and you need to be this person for others. My question for you is, do you have that person, do you have those small group of of men or women in your life that you can truly count on as a true friend? And do they view you that way? It's a chronic issue in our society of feeling lonely and feeling as though there is no one who you can truly rely upon. And as Forward Church, we desperately want to be that type of community that truly says, no, we, we have that level of community and friendship here. And so I want to invite you to take that step this fall. To be a part of these classes as we figure out together what does this look like as it spins off into greater community. And so to speak to the guys really quickly, we have a men's event coming up um, a week from now, uh, next Saturday. And... um, I think that this is a a great and important opportunity for us to connect together. And I'll speak really directly to it right now, as I've talked with different guys who've expressed a deep sense of loneliness, and yet we have this opportunity coming up. How many of you have actually taken advantage of it to be a part of it? Either that one-off event, or we have a class coming up. This is foundational for us as a church family to dig deeper together. And I want to invite you to be a part of it. I want to see you guys there. For the women, there's, there's a worship night tonight. And I'll just say this, guys, when it comes to registration, the women are blowing you out of the water. <laughs> just blowing you out of the water. We're trying to figure out how to get enough chairs in that room to figure out how they're going to do the prayer worship night. It's going to be in our foyer. Guys, I don't even know like, how to order food at this point. I'm like, I guess I'm ordering like, food for myself. Is that it? Like, one other guy? Got to be there. It's in this community that life change begins to truly happen. And so God cares about our hearts. He cares about our actions. And so to put this all together, our actions and our affections have real consequences. The Apostle Paul, he doesn't sugarcoat this in this passage. He he explains in chapter 5, he goes on to say, addressing all these things and addressing the issue of idolatry, he ends this verse by saying uh, that the, the person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 
You understand, he, he, he's addressing believers in this moment, in this passage, addressing, saying, hey, uh, your, the way in which you live can actually impact and can actually hurt your relationship with God. If you're feeling a spiritual dryness, if you're feeling as though you, you, uh, is God present in your life, he's saying, hey, uh, if, if you're not pursuing holiness in your life, that can actually hurt re- your relationship. And again, you, you know that you can have a relationship with someone, uh, but, it, but it's not a good relationship. You know that you can, you can be married, but you, you also know, like, hey, but we haven't really, like, talked or really connected in a few days or a few weeks. And you might say, okay, I, I feel like this relationship, like something's something going off here. And he's saying to us, as we read this, saying, hey, hey sin has this incredibly dangerous impact on our lives. Sin is the thing that separates us from him. And if you're not a believer, then that is a true separation. If you are a believer, then it feels as though that closeness isn't there. And so we need to take sin seriously. Uh, One author put it this way. He said, uh, if you went home today and saw a poisonous uh, snake in your your living room, uh, you wouldn't just ignore it. You You would spring into action. And he says, like, this, is, this is the way in which we should view sin in our lives, that it is poisonous and it has this deadly ability to drag us down. And so the Puritan author, uh, John Owen, he, he famously warns Christians in his book, The Mortification of Sin, um, love this line that he gives. He says, you neither be killing sin or it will be killing you. This is how serious we need to take it in our lives, understanding how it can be so poisonous and devastating to us and to the people around us. And and so the question then is, is what do we do with this? How do we respond? You know, do we just try really, really hard? Like, what's what's the answer to all of this? And, And what we need to see in this passage is this progression in the Apostle Paul's writing. Uh, starting off in verse 8, I'm going I'm to sh- read the passage and I'll, I'll show you the progression that happens here. Verse 8, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then verse 13 says, Everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, Get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. There are three things in this progression that is in this passage. We're to walk in the light, not in darkness. Jesus is light, so walk with Jesus. Walking in darkness is our natural bent. This is what we are all naturally bent towards. It's part of our sin nature. And so he says, okay, all of us are, are start off in this category. But then he says in verse 14, he says, but, but Jesus is light and he will, and this is the great good news, and he will shine upon us. He is the source of our holiness. He is the one who is able and willing to change us. And I love the imagery he gives here. And he will shine upon us. And this is what we should be earnestly be desiring in our lives is to be and have more of Jesus. To have more of him in our lives to the point where it can say, that we walk with him. We're reminded throughout that we need to walk in the light. We need to walk with Jesus. And so this involves making that decision to draw close to him and allow that relationship with him to radically change our lives. Whoever you're in relationship with is going to change you. Your friends are going to change you. That's why you need good friends. Your your spouse, just by very nature of that relationship, 
that is going to change you. And that's why I'm important of who you marry and in that selection process to make sure you're marrying someone good. And it's important to understand that if you are a few years into it and things are a little bit rough and understanding, hey, we need something outside of us to actually make this a good relationship. That's why we need Christ to be forming and shaping both of us in this relationship. The longer we walk with Jesus, the more that that relationship should change us. And walking with him is what changes us into emotionally and spiritually mature followers of him. And so, the last thing to leave you with this is that as we walk with Jesus, holiness should become more beautiful and sin should become more ugly. As we mature, we, sh- we should crave that which, is, that which is holy. We should be craving that which is pure. The deeper we go with him, this is what our, our desire should slowly change over time to become. And, and we know this in this understanding of maturity because all of us have experienced this at some level as you have grown and matured over time. Even just from being an, a child to becoming an adult. You know, as a child, you might be amused by by simple things. You might love to run around and play. But as you've grown and got older, suddenly realize that, hey, running around with your friends and, you know, playing, you know, army with your friends or something, like, all of a sudden, like, hey, like, that's not fun anymore. All of a sudden, like, what, what, what your attention's drawn to is something different. You know, a child might be drawn to some food that nowadays, as an adult, you just look to it and say, hey, that's disgusting. Like, I, how, how could you ever eat that thing? Our appetites change over time. And as we grow and mature in Christ, our appetites should change too. So we should see his holiness and we should see who Christ is as more and more beautiful. And as we mature in him, we should be able to identify things in our lives that we desire to change. And I think a hard part of this is as we recognize that, so often we still wrestle with, and yet we fall into sin again and again. And the hope that we need to understand is that when we fall short, that Christ is willing and able to receive us again. That he calls us to a life of confession to him, of confession and of repentance, desiring and asking him that he would transform us. And so I'm going to call up the worship team. I want to end in prayer as we focus on this idea of confession and of repentance. And I want to give you space this morning. A space to, to turn to him personally, to think of the ways in which you desire Christ to change you. And so I want us to spend some moment in prayer. I'm going to start us off, and I'm going to give you uh, just a moment to just speak personally to God. And that'll close us off and the worship team will lead us in song. So Lord,